Do the yellow one. Yeah, it's good enough. Yeah. I think so. Welcome to tonight's live chat. It's just going to be a little bit more relaxed. I actually just woke up from a nap. We've had multiple inches of rain today. I have been doing work. I, I promise you that. It's just uh, kind of been catching up with me lately. So Laurel said I was allowed to have a little bit of a, a nap. And so here we are. It's going to take me a second to uh, wake up all the way. I'm wearing a white t-shirt like I would be in a bee yard. So definitely not going to be a super fancy one. What? Oh, Natalie's coming. Okay. Hey, two to one. Well, how's it going over there? One to one. I, I tell you, it's going good over here. So swarm control is the, what we're going to be talking about primarily. Of course, taking your beekeeping questions and answers as well. I've had an action-packed week. I'm going to kind of sum it up real quick. So what are we doing right now? A lot of hive reversals, pulling brood from the ones that are really wanting to swarm and so the ones that are wanting to swarm are making those queen cups or they're just really packed with you know, just tons of brood but if we see some that have queen cups developed and an egg or two in them we pull a frame or brood of brood right now we give it to a colony that's maybe just a couple weeks behind it's one of those things where it takes a little bit of practice but out of a few hundred colonies you'll get some maybe 30 percent if you're lucky that are ahead of the game and we pull those back and maybe 30% that are right where you'd like to see them and then 30% that are behind. And in that group of 30%, um, hopefully some of those aren't that far behind and giving them a frame or two of brood, as long as they have a good queen, they'll be caught right back up so they can make either a honey crop or you can use them for, you know, raising queen cells, whatever it is. All right, so lots of folks on here. Hey, Laurel, don't forget to put that link on my Facebook page, please. I forgot to do it. So that's kind of what's going on right now. We haven't been feeding pollen patties for a couple weeks. Whenever I start seeing frames full of pollen, I definitely pull back. And this has been a good year. It started off a little bit like, eh, with that ice storm. But ever since then, we've had a lot of good flying days. And the bees have been making lots of pollen and it's been great, but you don't know what you're going to get. And we always are watching with the pollen patties this time of the year. It's a very sensitive time of the year. It's the most worthwhile time of the year to feed pollen patties if they need it. Um, right now, we don't. This time of the year, actually, we're kind of at risk for swarming because of too much pollen if the year's been good and it has the queen's running out of room to lay because they're packing so many cells with pollen i'd say a good double deep right now has at least four frames worth of bee bread socked away it's wonderful but then if you add four frames of honey or so that they've had left over from winter and now you're talking eight frames tied up and that's why we have a lot of the big counties in double deeps right now we have a lot of hardwood pollens early on in the year, and the bees really plug up from that. But it, it really varies. Some years we get a lot more rain, and so it's kind of right kind of balance. And then some years we have to feed those pollen patties this time of the year. Last year was one of those years. I was feeding bees at times. I had never fed bees before, and so it just you kind of have to watch it. All right, so Blanchard's Bees asks, Hi, Cayman. Is it true that you're coming to Iowa for a bee conference later this year? It is. I am going to be at the Iowa Honey Convention or whatever the that big Iowa conference is. I, I guess it, I think it's in Des Moines. I, I have it written down. Um, I've had a lot going on the last couple of weeks, so I apologize. But yes, I will be there. And it sounds like Bob Benny might be there too. So ooh, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. I have never been to Iowa. It's one of the states I haven't been to. Um, it'll probably remind me a lot of Indiana, corn, <laughs> and lots of it. Hey, Steve Chubb, thank you so much for your $20 donation. I see you found your way back on here just fine. 
Uh, thank you so much. If you have a question, um, leave it on the, the wall over there. Let's see here. So one of the things that's been going on this week, and a lot of people have been asking whether it's on here already or in other avenues, email and whatnot, how's the test yard going? And it's going good. Lots happening right now behind the scenes. I hoped we'd have it already installed by now in our first video. I'm getting a little bit of the runaround still with the uh, Corps of Engineers, but the mayor and I are making progress and I have I'm actually worked today on a backup yard. So basically if we don't have their yard available in the next week, we will be using a, a secondary location for the test yard, which will be, excuse me, fine. But I was really banking on using um, the airport area. It's just, it's a, there's a nice big area. A lot of people have a uh, bees in airports, actually Chicago O'Hara airport. A lot of airports have a uh, bees and whatnot. So I thought just, you know, it'd be a cool spot. Anyways, a lot of is going on behind the scenes with that. We had multiple of our sponsors show up this week. I'm bringing the, the rest of the equipment down that we needed for the, the test yard. The bees will be arriving the 9th of April. So we'll definitely be doing videos by then. And uh, it, it will be quite interesting. I think it's not only going to be great because we'll be able to really review and test these treatments that we legally can use, but also there's going to be a lot of videos of you just watching me maintain and build them. It'll be kind of like the package versus is nuke challenge, but it'll be more intense, definitely 10 times the amount of colonies. And on top of that, it's going to be more thorough and Thankfully, because of everyone's support, I, I'm going to be able to be much more thorough. We've, uh, especially because of our sponsors, it, it's going to be. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of time available for it. All right. Oh, is there an idiot, Laurel? I was probably going to take care of him. Don't worry about it. Let's see. Already getting overrun with small hive beetles outside of Jackson, Tennessee. What's your secret other than a strong hive? Well, yes, a strong hive is number one. Um, outside of that, um, th you can use Dynamax towels. There's some other products out there. I have found that Dynamax towels work the best as far as the towel method. Just put it more towards the edge of the the frames, you know, the hive. You don't want it right in the center. Um, some people get concerned about queens getting caught up in there. I've never seen any issues with that. But uh, if you don't feel comfortable using uh, towels like that, then you can use beetle blasters. There are some other products out there. Um, I like the, the beetle blasters. Maybe try some with oil in them. Try some with diatomaceous earth. As long as you don't spill the diatomaceous earth out of the tray, it won't hurt your bees at all. And, uh, you know, even if a tiny, tiny bit gets on a bee, um, it'll, it'll just be really irritating to them. But if you cover a bee up, it will kill it. Um, but I've had good results um, with that. So both of those will work pretty well. Well, Steve, um, you know, you could, I mean, if you wanted to, I haven't actually done individual hive sponsorship just because I hadn't really thought of that, but, uh, you know, that, that is possible. So, um, I, I haven't really thought about that. The sponsors that actually we I have right now are like sponsoring equipment and stuff, but I mean, I'm open to different things, but you know, the donation you just sent up there earlier is, is really helped and and where I, I really made a, a miscalculation and sometimes my youth and ambition get the better of me they have quite a bit over the years is that it's okay so we had this money set aside many of you all donated and, and whatnot however um i didn't really allow any funds for my time which is a big deal because if i'm putting it towards this where it needs to go and it's going to take you know probably 100 hours i'd say at least to do this this year uh, well, for Laurel and I on the low side, not including the video editing and all that kind of stuff, then, uh, you know, it's taking away from honey production and other things we could be making money at. So uh, all things considered, it's working out great. Um, our sponsors, Hilco, Apame, Good Job Bees, J&W Apiaries, Hat Bee Apiaries, and uh, oh, goodness, I know I'm missing one. Premier Foundation, really, really helping a lot. All right. 
let's get on get let's get on to swarming. So can you leave the beetle blast busters or blasters? Oh, okay. Beetle blasters and over the winter. I don't see why not. I, I have before. Hey Tim, uh hope you're doing good on the other side of the state. But yeah, you can leave those things in all the time. The biggest problem with the oil is if you tip the boxes or even if the bees glue them down, you try to pop, pry them up. The oil a lot of times will pop out of there and just you get rancid oil all over yourself and it, it's it's not fun. Swarm 28 feet up in a tree. Thoughts? Ladder is a few feet short. Already have traps around the yard. Unfortunately, traps seldom work close to where the bees swarm. I have caught a lot of swarms and swarm traps. I've never successfully caught any off of my own swarms. You know, like if I have one about a hundred feet from my hives or 200 feet from the hives, I've never, or even further, I just can't, I think they just want to go further away than that, but you know, hopefully it'll work out for you. Um, my opinion is they like to go further as far as getting to them. Do you know someone that has one of like those, uh, pool extenders, like they use to clean pools out? If you can get something like that, long extension, put a bucket on it, get up right underneath it, and then take that bucket and just, or a net or something like that, and just push it right up against that cluster and they'll fall in. It's, uh, you, you can use something like that. There's uh, there's some videos on ways that you can do that as well. Um, actually, I think a bucket, like with a uh, garbage bag in it or something like that, you push it around it and you quickly twist it or something. So it kind of ties it off just real quick and then you bring it down. And then when that happens, you know, you got to get them out quick because that plastic bag will suffocate them. Um, but there, there was a couple years ago where I was driving a truck and I, I had literally three swarms on a tree that must've been about 30 to 40 feet up. And it was a really thin tree. I had no way of getting to it. And each one of those swarms had to be at least four to five pounds or bigger. And it was just, I've, I've really literally had nightmares of that where I'll wake up and I'm, I'm dreaming about swarms hanging in the branches from my hives. And, uh, sometimes you just got to let them go though. Cause it's not worth risking your neck over. Holy smokes, Steve Chubb. Thank you very much. Wow. That might be the, the biggest um, that we've had on here. Well, Steve Chubb, thank you for sponsoring one of our hives. We'll have to, Laurel, we'll have to write this down so we can keep track of all these things. Um, but Steve, I really appreciate that very much. It's very generous of you. Um, but if you have some questions to go along with that, please hit me with it. Um, yeah, paint roller extensions, Ed Friel. Hey, Ed, hope you're doing good up there up north. Try to stay warm. So Laurel's doing a lot of deleting of stuff. So Laurel, do you want to just do some banning? Uh, banning's a whole lot easier. Well, St well, Steve, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We'll not let you ban. Uh, it must be um, it it must be a spam account, guys. Um, you know some of these robots and stuff. Laurel says that she's already deleted two accounts. You know it's weird. Sometimes we'll do this and we won't have any issues, and sometimes we will. Um, it, they must have just picked pick somebody out of the crowd. But anyways, um, well, a first year colony swarm usually it totally can. You can get a package of bees, you can get a nuke, you can do all kinds of stuff, and they will swarm. Uh, it, it, special, it especially is hard when you don't have drawn comb, but there are some things that you can do. So let's let's tackle that really quick, and then I will try to get to um, questions. So if you've already asked a question, and I've gone for a little while in the swarming, because that's what this thing is primarily supposed to touch, on um, just, just retype it in again or copy and paste it later, and once I'm done with this little swarming bit we'll get to your questions so we're going to talk about with foundation you don't have any drawn comb and then we're going to talk with drawn comb or like a little you know some variables here so swarming 
primarily is triggered, in my opinion, and I, I think this is pretty universally thought of by the queen running out of lane room. There are many different ways of keeping her in room. I have literally had five frame nukes that I was fixing to sell swarm on me. I have had four deep, strong colony hives that were in the middle of honey production swarm on me. And that's never fun. Let me tell you. And then there's also secondary swarms and that's even worse. So first of all, we got to keep that queen in lane room. If you don't have drawn comb, this is a challenge. There are a few products out there now that you can use to kind of help with this. There's like the better comb that's uh, made by better Bee, and some, you know, Frederick Dunn and Dan skis bees have done videos on that. And the stuff does work. I think for brood comb, that's, that's a, a poss excuse me, a possibility there. Um, I've never used it myself, but I really do trust both of those guys that is, they say, as long as it's wired, it works very good. So that can be a solution. Um, you really need to get some drawn comb of your own. Another reason why I say, and other beekeepers say, you know, don't cycle out your comb so quickly, get to that top out point where you have all the comb that you want and then start cycling it out first. I've had combs that have gone past 15 years. I've never seen any issues with combs that age. Some people will argue that till they're blue in the face. However, all the guys that I know that, you know, are professionals have kept combs 10 plus years. Now you get to a certain point and you can start cycling them out at five Three, every three to five years because you get so uh, so much comb, you're drawing so much every year. But you're not at that point if you're a new beekeeper. I'm just getting at this point, and I've been doing, this is my 18th season. Part of that's because we're, we've been constantly growing our numbers. But if you only have foundation, it kind of puts you in a bind, and it really depends on the year. 2019 was a terrible year for swarming it was a great honey year and it was a great year because what we would get was we would get little bits of rain just to keep everything producing well but then we'd get like six days in a row of sunshine and what do you think the bees are doing on those days pollen 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 nectar 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 and back filling back filling back filling colonies that had plenty of drawn comb made bumper crops of honey for us in tennessee on 2019 colonies that did not have any head what I call headspace or a drawn comb above them to where they can move that honey away from the brood nest and that excess pollen, they were fine. And we produced those record, uh, record crops on the big ones and the, on the ones that didn't have it. They just, we had a hard time keeping them from swarming. That was the year I had all those hanging in the trees. I was still driving and everything. And so what you can do to try to help your bees out is try to encourage them to draw comb. If you're in an area where you still are a month or so away and your colonies are really strong, you can actually stimulate them with some thin feed. It's always better, I think, to feed thin feed when you're trying to draw comb. I used, I didn't used to think that though. Um, I, I listened to some guys that said that uh, you know thick stuff was just as good, and uh, I don't I don't believe that anymore. I feed the really thin stuff and. Um, Bob's really the one that helped encourage me along that path, even thinner. I was going to one-to-one -one and he's like, you can go thinner than that came in. So he's using like three quarters of a pound of sugar to one part water on colonies that he's trying to get to draw comb so they don't backfill the brood nest. And you, know, they, you don't need a lot of mass. So if you can get them to draw comb early, then maybe you can get them to not swarm actually. And you're like, how does that work? So once the bees commit to something, they're really good at it. When the bees decide they want to draw comb, it's amazing how fast they can draw a whole super. When they decide to swarm, it's amazing how fast they swarm. And when they cap those swarm cells, it's amazing how hard it is to keep them from swarming. I mean, basically if I see capped queen cells, I, and I plan on swarming to happen if they haven't already. And whenever I catch those and I see those cap cells, we split them. Get to that in just one second. So again, most beekeepers don't have enough drawn comb. In the state of Tennessee, you can't buy it either. Um, you, you cannot buy used combs that are empty and all kinds of things like that. So in other states, you can. So if it's legal in your state to do so, 
You can find beekeepers that have excess and buy drawn comb and do yourself a big favor. Even just having one super can make a huge difference. Let's say you're running double deeps and you buy, you have 10 hives and you've purchased one medium super per hive and you pay 15 to $20 a piece, you know, check them out, make sure they're in good shape, all that kind of jazz. But if you do that, what you can do is put some foundations either underneath it in a box or above it in a box. And you can even do kind of like Ian does. And you can take a, one or two of those drawn combs out of there and drop some foundations in the center. And when they start drawing those out, you can pull them up into a box of foundations. But that extra box gives you a little bit of time. And once the bees commit to the honey flow, they don't want to swarm very aggressively. If you can just get them past that swarming season, get them into that that honey mindset that we're we're focusing on making a, a honey harvest now, they will start drawing comb for you and they will start storing it. And it's it's amazing. If you can get a powerful two, three deep colony to draw combs, they will draw a lot of combs for you, especially in a decent year. So it's, it's mainly getting them just past that point of swarming and in, into that mode. So what we can do is, one, we can buy comb. And if we legally cannot do that, then what can we do to stimulate them? It's tricky. It, it's it's kind of hard starting out. It's actually, it's, it's really hard starting out. You can make a little tiny splits. That can help a little bit. If you're not so set on these big honey crops we're like oh i'm going for that 100 pound honey crop yield and tennessee's not known for giant honey crops but strong colonies can make 100 pound honey crops here if they're strong at the right times of the year and the year's good you if, if you're not focused on that you can pull little bits of brood from the colony kind of pull them back just a little bit maybe you drop some frames of foundation pull a frame of brood out so let's say you have three colonies they're all looking pretty good for you or maybe only two of them are good and one's poor. And they're just, you can take brood over there, help that colony out. Or if they're all good, you can take three frames of brood and a shake or so of bees and purchase a queen. And now you have a nice split. And because you've pulled the bees population back a little bit, it's, it's kind of like a little swarm. And I would rather get 50 pounds of honey and have two good colonies than to have lost a swarm and still only get maybe 30 to 50 pounds of honey because they swarmed. That's just the way I look at it. But again, I'm in the business of selling bees. Um, you've got to get to that point where you get your bees to drawing combs. And your little colonies, like that little split that you just made, they're not going to readily want to swarm. They're going to want to expand because they're young. They have a new queen. And, and young queens don't want to swarm as much as old queens do. And that's their strong pheromone presence kind of pushes down that swarm tendency. But the number one thing is you've got to keep, keep that queen in laying room. Whether you're introducing empty combs into the brood nest, so you, you, you pull something out and you put a, a drawn comb in, if you have it, that, that'll work. Have drawn comb above or you've got to get them to the mode of drawing those foundations out. And even when you do all of these things, even if you have drawn comb, there's still some swarming issues that we face. Every colony wants to swarm. Some bees are less swarmy than others. Um, that's one of the things that we try to select for, but you can only go so far with this trait. I mean, it's as natural as a cow giving birth to a calf. So what I want to do is, first of all, I select bees that aren't really aggressive about it. That helps some, but even those, even the best of those are still going to want to swarm. That's why we cut them back. We cut them back just so they can kind of keep that swarming impulse at, we can keep that swarming impulse at bay. And then once again, they commit to that honey harvest. They start focusing on that honey crop and get in the mindset that now we're going to draw comb. We're in expansion mode. We're in honey production mode. The swarming, Tendency really is retarded big time. If they get plugged out later where the, the, the brood nest is getting plugged and the queen runs out of room to lay, they will start swarm the swarm tendency again. But I find that if you get them on that right path and they start focusing on drawing comb 
and storing honey, and they have the, the ways to do it, um, it r significantly retards swarming. But we, we, we check the colonies quite a bit this time of the year. I'm getting to every colony right now once a week, no later than 10 days. Um, it's not like I'm going through and just like, oh, there's a frame. Look at this frame. Look at this frame. We're going through, making sure they have space. If they're too big, we're pulling them back. If they're too little, we're identifying them. And, and there's a few colonies that are having to be fed. I'd say probably, oh, 20 colonies, something like that. But they're, they're, you know, they're brooding up heavy and they're going to starve themselves to death. Not ne enough nectar coming in. Plenty of bee bread. I don't like feeding this time of the year. Um, but some colonies are running out of stores. So there's just a lot of different things and you have to take it by a per colony basis. It's definitely not a one size fits all program. We're going through primarily and I just gl glancing an eyeball over the colony. We're popping the doubles and we're peeking up underneath. Oh, this one's trying to start building uh, queen cups in mass and oh, they're actually have some larvae in them. Oh boy, now we have to go through this one and go through all the frames of brood and make sure if there is any queen cells, if we don't want this colony to swarm, we got to smash it. And the, if we if we want to keep it together, and then we're we're probably going to look at pulling a frame or two of brood from this colony and giving it to another. That's what we're doing right now. I'm working on trying to get a video for that. Having a hard time finding time for videos, um, but I'm I'm going to get them done. And then the little colonies finding which ones need space. Um, I know from the history of my area, which this is again, where you paying attention to what's going on around you and talking to those successful beekeepers in your area can help is uh, when to start adding those honey supers. And if you're not sure, just add a little bit and just keep an eye on them. Um, I learned a hard lesson last year. Many of you noticed and found out last year that, um, it wasn't very good for me. It wasn't good at all. It was the worst honey crop year I've ever had. I was feeding bees again at weird times. And, but it was, a, it was an important lesson. I learned the value of good bee yards. I also learned the value of not supering too much too early. 2019 was like the perfect year for honey in my area. And I didn't super fast enough. 2020, I thought, well, this year I'm going to super faster because just when you think you've got it figured out, nature pulls the rug out from underneath you. And it did. And I put about four, every colony had at least four deep boxes to five deep boxes worth of space. But at the time that I super, they were only occupying about two deep boxes on the bigger side. They were occupying two and a half to three and just getting to that point. I was going to get ahead of the game, get it done. We had that monstrously cold April, wet April, and even wet, it was 29 degrees, May 8th. That never happens here, hardly ever. I was selling nukes to people in long underwear. What in the world? Usually that time of the year, we have a better chance of being in the 90s. And right now we're typically in the 70s, and that's what we've been having. So it set the bees back, and Christian um, – Shannon asked this question on my Facebook, and I said that I'd bring it on here. We had European fowl brood like we usually never have in our colonies. It, it, they had so much headspace, and they, the, the nutrition wasn't there, and I should have seen it coming, and I should have got into those colonies and not give, taken some of that space off the top so they could have held that temperature better. And I also should have thrown some pollen patties in um, just to help them out with the protein um, the lack of protein. And that was part of the reason why the European fowl brood um, came about. It wasn't like a crazy bad case. It cleaned up as soon as it got better in May, but it set the bees back and also they weren't able to fly a lot. So nutritionally they were compromised. Um, the temperature, I mean, it was just dropping in crazy cold temperatures for that time of the year. And I learned that lesson the hard way. So again, variables here, if you're not sure, start with just a super or two and, and don't overdo it. Um, this year, I'm definitely going to be a little bit more careful throwing that space on and pay more attention to the weather forecast. Now, real quick, I need to say thank you to, um, well, it froze up on me. Let's see here. Where in the world did that go? Brian Reese. I should have known. Brian, thank you very much again for supporting our channel and our experimental yard. And I'll, I promise I'll get to some questions here in just one second, but so it's getting back to swarming. 
a lot of people have asked why I do the single brood management and how I'm able to do that. Again, once I get the bees to commit to putting that honey above that excluder, you can do it. It's all about getting the bees focused in the right areas. Bees run completely off of stimuli. They don't sit down and they rationalize or think. They go off of the stimuli that they are fed from each other and what nature gives them. And also the stimuli that we might encourage for better or for worse in, uh, that we expose them to. So what I'm doing when I do the single brood management, I've got them in double deeps right now. We get in a couple more weeks here. I'm going to throw those honey supers on. I'm going to take one of those deep boxes off and then I'm going to use it to give into smaller colonies and, and stuff like that. And then I'm going to put that excluder on. I'm going to put almost all the brood below, but not quite all of it. And the queen's going to be stuck down there underneath it. And they, thankfully for me, since I have all the drawn comb, it's very easy for the bees to commit to putting honey above the queen excluder when there's drawn combs. They see that as their comb. When you do that with foundations, if you if you put an excluder and then put foundations above it, that's a great way to get your bees to swarm. They do not like to draw a foundation of any kind above a queen excluder. Now, if they start drawing those foundations and they have about two combs drawn thereabouts, and then you, um, you know, sh make sure the queen's not up there, then put a queen excluder under those foundations, you can totally do that. Once they commit to drawing in that super and they have some combs, it's it's a it's totally different than putting foundations, but I would never recommend putting a, um, an excluder and then putting foundations on top unless there's some combs to go up there with it. Swarm. Yeah. As far as swarm traps go, everyone needs to get them up right now in Tennessee. If you're in our area, I mean, they're starting to hit in the South part of the state. So what do we do when we have a colony that has capped cells if we we come across the colony that has capped queen cells they're going to swarm we assume they are i'm i'm not sure i've ever been successful keeping them from swarming by doing just smashing the cells and, and it has never worked for me they've already committed so the only way i know to keep them from swarming at that point is if the queen if they haven't swarmed yet and the queen's still in there if you can find her and you make a split with the the original queen and then crush the cells. You can do that. Um, that. That has worked for me. I go down in there and find the queen, make it, take a couple frames of brood and a couple shakes of bees and make a nucleus colony with that queen. And you can leave like one cell. What I, I like to do my personal opinion on that is I don't like to leave that colony a cell because they still have that stimuli going. So I'm going to take, if I, if I want to raise another queen, if I don't have queen cells, I will take a frame that has some capped queen cells on it and a shake of bees and basically make a mating nuke. You can even make multiple ones. And then after the queens come back, after the hive settled down and they realize they're completely queenless and they have no queen cells, because what will happen sometimes if you let those queen cells stay in there is that they'll emerge and then you'll get what's called a virgin swarm. And... I've caught swarms that have literally had nine, as many as nine virgins in a swarm of about five to six pounds of bees. So they will swarm with virgins. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with, um, at least heard of clipping queen's wings. And this basically keeps the original queen. It's kind of an old technique. It doesn't, a lot of people don't use it anymore because it, you'll, you'll, you'll hear why. So the queen will try to fly out with a swarming impulse and she can't if the wings are clipped properly and she falls out somewhere in the grass. And if you've kept it mowed, usually the swarm will fall down upon her and then you can pick it up and, and catch it. Um, however, um, if you're not out there and you don't see it, sometimes the swarm will leave without her and you lose your queen and you lose the swarm or the swarm will come back and the queen just dies out there. And then as soon as the virgin cells emerge with the virgins, then they'll take off with them. So it only buys you a few days because a lot of times when the queens swarm, there's only a couple days until the virgins uh, emerge out of there anyways. So it really, I don't see a whole lot of purpose for clipping a queen's wings. I think there's better approaches to it as far as keeping the queen in laying room. 
and maybe cutting the colony back like we do, pulling the bees back just a little bit until they've committed to that honey flow. Also on the secondary swarms. So this is a, this, this one just kills you. And some people don't like this, but what I find works some really good for me. And I, I've been really frustrated with the secondary swarms because first you're losing one swarm. It's, it's, it's frustrating when you lose a secondary swarm, it's devastating typically. So last year I had three colonies in a yard. It was my overflow yard. I was running behind. They were singles that they, they were late summer Queens that I made in August, um, ran through the winter with some nukes. I got them into a 10 frame box and then I didn't get to them fast enough. And I tried to, um, you know, just, uh, they swarmed on me in that single, but I, I thought, well, well, hopefully at least the virgins will come back and I'll get some young queens out of these three. I didn't get them spaced quick enough and I lost those three. All three of those, as soon as the virgins emerged, took the rest of the bees. So that's the thing. A lot of times when you lose a swarm and it's at the, the uh, first swarm, which is called a prime swarm, you lose like 60 to 80% of the population, but you also have a ton of brood typically. So if you, if you're not checking very often, you come back a week later and they don't perform a secondary swarm. There's still a decent minute, bit of bees in there. Not as much as you'd like for honey production, but still pretty decent. But when they swarm the second time, you haven't had a laying queen in a while. Almost all of your brood has emerged and they take off. And literally between the two of those, you might not have enough bees to cover five frames maybe not even three frames. And that was the case with these. And that's where small hive beetles will take over that colony because it's just abandoned pretty much. You might have a double deep with only three frames of bees in there, all kinds of bee bread and all kinds of stuff exposed for those beetles and wax moss to take over. This day and age, if I lose a swarm and I, I go ahead and I, um, some people won't like this. I, I crush the uh, swarm cells. I have my own Queens though. So I completely retard. There's no chance for them to have that secondary swarm. I want nothing to do with it. Um, you can split, make splits with those instead and break it up. Um, but I definitely, secondary swarms can kill you. So that's, let's go to questions on swarming. There's several things that I've missed here. There's things like checkerboarding, which basically all of the manipulations of swarm prevention are similar. There's just kind of different techniques, but they kind of all follow the same principles of keeping the queen in lane room and keeping the bees in room to keep the queen in lane room. So, um, yes. Um, like, a can I eat it? Um, says you can click the bell if you go to our main page and you click the bell, you can uh, monitor the notifications and you can make it to you where you never miss any notifications and all that kind of stuff. Is there any merit to placing a queen excluder underneath the deep box to catch swarms? I have attempted to do that. The problem is, is typically the queens shrink down so much when they um, fly, they literally can shrink down um, 50 to 100 percent. Uh, from the time they were laying to the time that um, they take off. And, and most queens will be thin enough to go through an excluder. In my experience, when I've tried it, um, they still swarm anyways. Um, plus, it's a lot of work. So um, I, some people might have success with it if you have a nice fat-bottomed queen. But uh, I think when those queens shrink down, that they'll get through there. But basically, for those of you who don't know... Um, they literally um, will chase the queen around the hive when the swarm tendency happens. See, the queen's not the one that decides this. And then they're like, you know what? We're swarming. And they'll chase her around. They'll chase her around. They'll chase her around. And she'll stop laying. And once she stops laying, uh, she stops producing so much. And, and she shrinks down quite a bit. Let's see. I know I've missed a lot of questions. So, um if you have already asked and you'd like to ask it again, go ahead and re-ask. All right. Hat B Acres is on here. One of our sponsors. I've heard the moment the queen lays an egg in a swarm cell, the colony gets in the want to swarm mode. Um, I don't know if it's actually the queen laying in that. I, I think it's more of other things personally. I, I think it's a combination of things. I also think that it's important for bees to draw combs, even though I don't, 
necessarily have to draw combs this year. I'm still going to do that for multiple reasons. Getting young, fresh combs is fantastic. And I think a great strategy, but also I believe that when the bees want to draw a comb and they have nowhere to draw it, I think that, um, that creates some congestion problems. I think that they want to, exp you know, make that comb expansion. And I think that's a small portion of it. Number one is the queen running out of room to lay. I think personally, when it comes to queens laying in, queen cells and um anything like that i think they're just so desperate this time of the year they're laying so hard to find anywhere to put an egg um, they will literally put it anywhere and that's why you can't always assume that swarm cells are at the bottom of the frame and supersede your cells are on the top typically that's the case by and large that is correct but it could be swarm season you could have eight cells hanging off the bottom of frames and if you don't check up on a frame, you think you've crushed all those down below if you're trying to retard it. And she found a queen cup from a super procedure a few years back or whatever up on top of a comb. She'll lay in that too. And they'll treat it just like a swarm cell. And if it's there and it emerges, yeah, it's going to happen. Bob Benny using double screen boards with swarm cells to make a nuke. Oh, yeah. Double screens are great. I've got several of them right now. They're very useful to have. They're not, um, I don't, I don't use them as much for overwintering. I prefer overwintering bigger colonies. And I know Bob prefers that too, but sometimes things happen. And that's why I, I have some colonies that are over another colony in a double screen, but I love them for other reasons. Like you get a swarm situation or like we are queen rearing right now. And as I was, initially pulling the good frames of emerging calved brood and everything I needed to make up my queen rearing colony, my starter, I, um, we, we were having a big rainstorm come in. So I stuck it over a double, uh, a big, strong pack double, put a double screen board and then put those above. Um, so it helped keeps it warm. Double screen boards are, are very useful and have a lot of different, um, things that you can use them for. I, I really like them. Should I treat a first year colony for Varroa mites? Absolutely. If you do the math, the mites double every month. So if you start off, average package starts off with at least 100 mites. And I would say nukes on average start off with even more than that. So one month, two months, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200. They grow rapidly. It's the main reason why people lose bees or have little colonies coming out of winter. Um, I highly recommend treating first year colonies here in Tennessee. If I start a package in April, it will be dead most of the time by October due to Varroa mites. Will colony swarm when there is no queen cells? Well, if you've eliminated all of them and they still have the, the queen, they will. Um, I've never lost but if, if they won't just up and swarm without making queen cells, now they will abscond, which is a very different thing, which comes from virus loads, which comes from overheating, which can come from um, pest pressure, like maybe too many ants on a weak colony. Um, heat, heat can happen, definitely. Um, but ab absconding, they will definitely totally leave. They'll leave brood, good frames of capped brood in there. They'll leave all kinds of stuff. And uh, no queen cells at all. They just abscond. Oh, boy. Ricky asked the $5 million question. Came in your hives always look strong. How many swarms do you lose each year? Well, not all of my colonies are that strong. Um, but I am pretty pleased with how they look. Um, by and large, um, my bees are, are pretty good. Um, and that, But that comes from lots of work. It's really not any magic... Um, thing that we're doing any differently. We, we're telling you guys how we're doing it. The, the great queens really helps and the hard nosed mic control really helps. Um, but how many swarms do I lose each year? Oh man, I, I really don't know the answer to that. I would say last year on the low end, I would say I probably lost over the season a dozen just because I know I probably lost four or five that I know of. And then I would say double that, maybe triple that. Um, but you know, probably 10 to 12, I try to be really hard nosed. And again, I am not a honey production is not my main source of income. Um, I would rather sell bees or Queens 
And so it is, I mean, honey production is important to me still, but I would rather cut back the hives again and have 80 pounds of production and not really risk losing a swarm than try to go for that 120 pound yield on that colony in the same year and, and have a high risk of swarming. So, um, that's, that's really helped me a lot is not, is not keeping the colonies quite so big. And so I just make splits instead, and then I, I can sell those. And that seems to work really good. I hate losing swarms because, I mean, literally, a good swarm off of a prime colony can be five, six pounds of bees. I mean, goodness, that's like 300 bucks flying through the air. That hurts. How soon after installing a new package without any drawn comb would you treat for mites? Okay. Well... Is it too early to treat for mites? So a lot of the mite questions. It's never too early, never too late to treat for mites, but it, you got to be careful with what you with what you use and when you use it. Oxalic acid, when I get packages, I use them about a week after I install them. I install them and I get some feed in there through a jar feeder or something like that or a bucket feeder. I don't use a frame feeder right away on anything like a package or a new swarm because they're too frantic and they can drown quite a bit. Um, but anyways, get some feed in those bees. Let that queen come out and start laying. And then I come back usually um, about eight or nine days after installation. And then I'm going to check and make sure that there's brood in there. But there shouldn't be capped brood at that point because it'll take it a couple of days for the queen to start laying really good. And it shouldn't be cat brew, just larvae. And if you want, you can do a soft oxalic acid treatment and really just take the mites out right at the knees. So that's a wonderful time with packages to, to do an oxalic acid treatment. Um, once they start getting capped brood, it becomes a lot more complicated. Um, but that's how fast you can treat right after a, a package is installed. And I, I suggest that once those bees of yours, if you're using a 10 frame deep, once they get about eight frames, they start drawing that eighth frame in that 10 frame box, put on your second deep and, and get them already used to that, that box and then pull one of those frames up of larvae and center it above the rest of the brood so they can keep that warm because you want them to focus on drawing that foundation and continue that stage. You don't want them to, Oh, we've run out of stuff to draw, Pl take that energy and plug up the brood nest. And now, um, they, they go into swarm mode and you can lose, you can literally have a package swarm on you in less than two months. If uh, they don't stay in that building mode. Um, University of the South Farm, is pollen stored as bee bread last fall useful to give to a capture swarm now? Does pollen stored outdoors over winter expire? Um, it does lose nutritional quality. I do give it to them, though, and I let them choose whether to use it or not. I don't, maybe they'll find some usefulness. It could be this time of the year with so much fresh stuff coming in, they might just pull it out and chuck it. Uh, but if they find use with it, fantastic. Um, I, I'm pulling some frames of bee bread right now and sticking them in the freezer to use with my queen rearing, um, colonies in summer. So when we don't get a whole lot of fresh pollen coming in, so, you know, it, it's, uh, I don't know exactly. There is some research. I do know that just like any food product it, over time, it does kind of lower its nutritional value, but honey is the same. It's, it's not, we think it's immortal and it kind of is. But to, to the bees, nutritionally, it goes downhill somewhat rapidly. Over time, honey can even develop HMF in it. That's long-term, though. And, but also, it can get you know, more granulation and more solids, all kinds of stuff that can make it actually hard on the bees over time. Our guts are very different, so what actually is not bothering us at all can not be ideal for the bees. So um, you know, basically, their food products, just like our food, food products have somewhat of a shelf life. Can I vaporize a package of bees before installing? You can, but the problem with the vapor is that it's not really good about penetrating that cluster in the package. And if, if I was going to do that, um, I would like have a sealed box and then put the, like you can basically take a flat board, a deep box, put the package or two packages in a deep box and then put a sealed lid on top 
have a hole or something where you can vaporize into that. Um, but, but keep in mind, it's got to get in that cluster. So maybe picking that thing up and dropping it. So the bees fall down and have to crawl their way back up. You've broken that cluster as that vapors in there can help get around those bees. I don't know what the efficiency, um, or the, uh, the effectiveness of that is going to be. Let's see here. I missed something. Curtis Lyons. Thank you so much, Curtis. Thanks for coming on. How often should you introduce new genes to your apiary? What do you look for when you purchase packages? Well, I don't really per purchase packages these days, thank goodness, because um, it's expensive. But um, whether you're buying packages or you're buying queens or whatever, a lot of people, people get caught up in local genetics. And I do believe there's something to it, but I believe it's somewhat overblown. It's almost like the whole local honey thing is good for your allergies. There is some partial truth to that. I get allergies. You can probably hear some of it. I get allergies this time every year. I eat more honey than 99% of the U.S. population. I chug honey. If you guys watch the Contrary Beekeepers podcast, I like chug honey literally during the entire thing. It might, it, it maybe it helps a little bit, but the thing of it is, it's there's, there's variables here. And when I get allergies, it's from things that don't produce honey and, and the bees don't always necessarily produce pollen from, get pollen from these plants either. So same thing when looking for genetics, those local bees, there's limitations and I've purchased bees from all over the country and they're either good or they're not. I have found some Queens that were from Georgia that were awesome. I found some from Vermont that were awesome. I've also gotten a bunch from Georgia that stunk and a few from Vermont that stunk. And some of my Queens aren't the greatest in the world. Um, they didn't get made a good or something like that. Um, and definitely, uh, you know, other States as well. So quality of the queen, that's number one. I do believe in extreme cases, like if you're trying to take a Florida bee and overwinter it in Canada, there can be some issues there, but in places like Tennessee where you're very neutral, we don't have tough winters. I can, I promise you if it's a quality queen that's mated properly, I can overwinter your bee here. We don't winter kill here. It's about the quality of the queen. And I really don't care where they're from. If I'm purchasing queens, all I want is a queen that lays good bees and has the genetics that I want to see though, is I don't want to see European foul brood. I don't want to see any of that kind of stuff. Genetics plays a big role into foul brood and, and brood diseases, some hygienic behavior. Unfortunately, Varroa is a little bit more complicated, but when it comes to those older, lesser brood diseases, um, genetics is very important. And, and again, 99% of my bees are raised by myself and my wife. So we have a large bit of control. The only bees that I've purchased recently of any quantity were from Michael Palmer. And I was pleased by and large with that order. Um, they were very hard to get. It took me like a year. And um, then he didn't even give me any heads up. He's like, hey, by the way, I'm shipping you some queens. And I'm like, ah, this is like the worst week in the history of weeks for these queens to come. And it really was. But uh, anyways, that's another story for another time. But so, a couple of those queens were duds, you know, um, but the, uh, most of the queens were really great. So I highly recommend everyone encouraging somebody to raise queens locally to you that you can buy from, even buy queen cells from them or do it yourself. It makes a world of difference. Hey, Yasmin, all the way out there in Sweden. I heard that you had your first bit of pollen coming in, so that is awesome. I'm excited to, to hear what's going over, on over there, and um, you got to show me some pictures of some of that Swedish honey whenever that comes in. I'm sure that it's going to be good. Um, yeah, I hope you have a really good season over there. And... Um, then getting to the question below that is using Apivar strips. Are you doing it this year? And just like Bob Benny, I am not. I was talking to Bob at our conference in January about um, his experience with them because mine was really abysmal. I was really frustrated. I was doing alcohol washes afterwards, and I was just not getting the knockback. And the thing of it was, some of these colonies were almost broodless during the Apivar strips. And I put them in the right position. They were fresh. The dates were right. Everything was the way it was supposed to be done. They didn't work. And Bob buys a bunch and they didn't work for him either. And when someone of Bob's size is stopping using something, that's, that's some warning bells going off in, 
in my mind. So what percentage of losses are normal for winter in Tennessee? You can have zero losses if your bees are in good shape. Um, it really depends on your area. Um, I did lose some bees this winter. They were all the small little ones that I was trying to squeak through. None of the good, none of the health the bees that went in healthy, they all came out healthy. It's uh, it's, I know that sounds kind of basic, but that's kind of as simple as it is. But it's not that simple getting them to that point. Getting your bees, and this is one of the talk I'm, I'm having down in Texas in uh, June. They asked me to talk about overwintering in June. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, it, there'd be probably 108 degrees in Texas. Um, but it's, it's great though, because you literally start planning for winter. I start planning for it in August. And I mean, I, I'm always focused on those winter bees. That's why we treat in June. That's why we treat in August, keep those bees clean and healthy and, and keep young Queens in there. But what percentage of losses are normal for winter? You can survive 30%. If the other 70% are in good shape, um, I would rather not do that. The last Ooh, lightning bolt. Um, last couple years, uh, you know, it's been more in the eight to 10% area for me and I can live with that. A lot of the colonies I lost this year were little four framers and two framers. I was trying to overwinter and some of them made it and some of them did not. Um, for those of you who watched the video where I took one of my mating nukes and I had th um, the, you know, the three way compartments, there's three frames, deep frames, three frame, deep frames and three more. I put, um, it was late in the season. I had some bees that were a little strong and I decided to just try it out and see if it would work for me. And it did not. Um, I, I got one out of three to survive. And, and even the one that, that came out of winter, well, two of them survived, but one of them's worthless. And then the other one is still at this point in March, only occupying two frames of bees. They're just now starting to get ground speed. I've got colonies that I've pulled more bees out of twice the, as many bees as that out of there. I don't like overwintering clusters um, that are going into winter smaller than eight frames of bees, to be honest. Um, you can do it, um, but I don't like fooling with that anymore. It's just they, I have a higher percentage of loss. Um, I, bigger colonies just handle it better, that thermal mass and all that stuff. And, and they do better about keeping the condensation off of themselves. I got to say thank you really quick to Melissa's Harvest very much again for coming on and donating to our channel and to the test yard. By the way, for those of you who weren't in here earlier, that is underway. I was hoping to have the first video out by now, but I'm having an issue on location. So we're working on a secondary location. It will be done. Um, I've got everything pretty much lined up by and large and except the location. And we um, will have the bees here. April 9th. So there will be some videos coming soon on that. And I'm, I'm super excited about what I'm going to learn from it. Have you ever tried formic acid? Good stuff. I've never been able to use it in a way that I thought was beneficial with my season. When I feel like I need a treat, it's, it's usually June or August and formic just is, it's, well, it's not in its temperature range at that point. All right. Do you only use oxalic acid to treat for mites then? Um, no, I don't. I actually, um, last year I was using Apivar in a combination with Apigard, which is a thymol product, and then also using oxalic acid vapor. Um, this year we're going to be primarily using Apigard and oxalic acid. Now in the test yard, we're going to be using multiple things. And if I have the time, I doubt I'm going to do a test on Apivar in a whole bee yard, just purchasing the strips and putting it in about 40 to 50 colonies, alcohol washes before alcohol washes afterward and see if it works for me this year. It did not last year. Let's see. Yeah, well, you know, in, in Queens, um, you know, there this is okay. I've got to get on my soapbox. I haven't really gotten a soapbox yet. So here we go, guys. Everyone get ready, brace yourself. 
to have your toe stepped on if this is you. Um, no, seriously, though. One of the things about Facebook is you get to, it seems like whenever we get a good post on Facebook about a beekeeper who actually does something diligent and hardworking, it gets like 15 thumbs up. Woo, good job. Somebody posts something that's heartfelt, emotional, and completely ridiculous about beekeeping, and it gets 1,500. That's just the way that it goes. Well, and I, hey, I hate losing queens. I hate seeing queens die. Nature is not like we have set up a soft, gloved, padded, gloved world around us, but that's not the way it is in the nature of bees. And old queens got to go. And that's one thing that it's a hard lesson I had to learn, but literally you're, you're doing a high of a service sometimes requeening. If you have a problem with killing a queen, you can do something about that too. You can just go to that double deep or whatever size colony it is, pull the original queen out, make a small split with it. If she's a good queen still and able to build that little colony back up with some TLC, then that's fantastic. And if the, the bees replace her, that's fantastic. Even if you lose that colony outright, as long that you still have that original colony with that young queen. And I don't know how many times um, I lose queens, uh, colonies due to poor queens. And the guy that asked about Merry Quit Christmas 2.0 that asked about the uh, the queens and uh, all that, you, uh, I I'd say my second biggest losses, you're talking about queen uh, winter losses, are due to queen issues. I would say half of the losses, at least this winter, were related to poor queens. Um, just, they, they just couldn't produce enough bees going into winter and they didn't make enough winter bees to maintain the cluster. Um, those, sometimes those second or third year Queens, definitely third year Queens. I don't, I don't let them get that old anymore, but we just got to realize the Queens don't live that long. Yes. There's a few people that talk about online that they have five year Queens, but in the reality of it, Queens that make it to three seasons are exceptional and rare. And as, uh, typically, as far as actually performing good, um, they don't. They typically don't, especially the further south that you are. And I find a lot of these guys and gals that talk about their immortal queens don't realize that most colonies supersede during the season, whether you realize it or not. And you just, you're not there to see it. And they do. And if you don't mark your queens or number your queens, how do you really know? A lot of times the daughters look the same, except they lay a whole lot better. Let's see. Well, sure. I mean, all you have to do is look at um, the news or stuff on YouTube or Facebook or anywhere. And um, drama is what brings people in. You know, it's like the, everyone's talking about the murder hornets, even though they're not murder hornets. They're just another creature trying to survive the best way they know how. Not that I'm a big fan of them, but that title is, is silly. So, um, you know, whether, whether whatever side of the political realm that you're on, um, the, the media is preying upon all of us with clickbait and drama that none of us need. None of us need it. Let's see. How long will a queenless hive coming out of winter last or let? Well, lane worker start lane. It'll happen pretty quick. Typically, once they run out of brood, um, they really start getting that way. So if you if you want to retard it, like you see a colony going down that road and you're waiting for a queen to come in. So say you have a colony like, oh man, they're queenless. They hardly have any brood left. I, I'm going to order a queen. And you want to try to salvage that colony, start putting fresh eggs and start putting larvae in there. And that normal worker brood, um, the female worker brood suppresses that lane worker, um, tendency in those bees. Um, however, just keep in mind as you're introducing that young stuff, they're going to raise cells with that. So if you're ordering a queen and you pop her in there and one of those cells emerges, a virgin is going to come out and kill your mated queen. So you need to make sure you eliminate those, uh, those cells. If you're, pl you're planning on doing it that way. Oh, hey, Don. Um, thank you so much for that orange blossom, honey. I've really enjoyed that. 
my kids have too, but I, everyone that sent me honey, I, I had to put it high up on the shelf so it, I can survive to taste it once or twice. Hey, Ricky, um, before you leave, I just wanted to say thanks for coming on. Also, one of our upcoming videos in the next handful of days is going to be on installing a big colony in that horizontal hive. I wanted to put a massive colony I know is going to produce honey in there because I would love to produce some honey out of a horizontal hive this year. So, and that'll be fun to see how we'll have to manage that differently. So that'll be fun. Probably do a handful of videos on that at least. Hey, John. Yeah, the storms, uh, you know, we just had a big goalie washer. It's pretty normal for this time of the year. Um, lots of wind and, and stuff. Um, unfortunately for the folks in Alabama, it was a little bit more than that. We're praying for them. Um, but anyways, is it a good idea to add a frame of brood and nurse bees to a package when starting a new hive? If you have it to spare, like say you've got one colony that's awesome and you're ordering some extra bees because you want to expand or whatever, then that, that'd be great. That, uh, that big colony, maybe it's too big and you're trying to pull them back to prevent swarming a little bit. So you pull a frame of capped brood or you pull a frame of, um, you shake some nurse bees in there or whatever, that will greatly help that package. Some packages have quite a few old bees in there and they don't last very long. And a package literally is, you know, they've got to get it going on. Bees don't live very long. And so the quicker and the, the easier you can make their first initial round of brood, the, the faster they're going to build. If possible, give them a frame of capped brood so they don't have to do much work at all and they can focus the energy on just heating it and feeding other larvae that their new queen's going to raise. But yeah, you can totally do that. Yeah, and that's the thing with Apifar, guys, is some people are saying it's working really good, and it has worked really good for me in the past. That's, that's strange, you know, and Bob Benny, I mean, the guy doesn't mess around, and, you know, Bob knows guys that keeps more bees than he does, and he keeps thousands um, and has kept even more than that, and they're dropping Apifar as well. I don't, you know, and some people are arguing with, with me on resistance or batch quality. Either way, there's, there's some concerning things with it and whether you trust it or not it's always good to verify um smart man said that one time but um i'm definitely going if i if i do an, a test on it this year on a b yard and i'm totally going to be doing alcohol washes afterwards um right afterwards and making sure that it does its job have you ever tried a dual queen system for honey production reindeers bees um no, I have not. Um, I've talked to some people who have, and you know, it just, it's, it's one of those things that's cool, but it, I'm not sure it's really that super beneficial. Bee Culture Magazine, I got um, a subscription given to me for Christmas. And one of the interesting things they had in this um, month's episode uh, or magazine was a dual queen hive. And it, it is interesting. I would love to do a video series on that in the future. I know I won't get around to that this year. Um, but it looks like a lot of fun. And I can see where it works. And Ian kind of does that um, in a way with his nukes. So like a three-way um, system. So uh, it can totally work. It's just another manipulation um, to me. I'm pretty satisfied with what I have um, going on. and uh, But yeah, it could totally work. I would love to see... Um, people doing more unique things like that because the more people I see doing that and the more people I see keeping bees in horizontal hives and, and things like that, I think we've kind of, we're, we're getting away from the, we're getting better beekeepers, honestly. And, and it's, it's happening. It's, it, it's really happening at every year, the last couple of years, I, I'm starting to see more people be successful. The right education is getting out there and it's not just, I'm not saying that I'm the one doing it. It's just uh, there's other people who are really contributing and the right people. And it's making a big difference for me and for others. Hey, ETs, bees, it's going good. It's going awesome. I'm telling you, the bees are looking good. I'm enjoying it. I'm just having an awesome time. Hey, M. Merrick, miss this program. Can I watch this presentation somewhere? So this presentation, we talked a lot about swarming already and other things, but it will be available as soon as the video is done. It'll take a little while for it to upload. Keep in mind, whenever 
a lot of times when I get done with these, I forget because whenever I film a video and I edit them, I can control the ads. Um, YouTube wants to, if you, if you give it free reign, like a lot of times I'll just crash after one of these live chats and YouTube, literally I've had some complaints and, and rightly so they will take a live chat and they will put like 40 ads in the first hour. I kid you not. It's just stupid. They, they've implemented a new program and you have to manually go in. There's still some of my old videos. I haven't gone back and edited where they've just put too many ads in there. So, um, I will, tr I will, Shut it off actually after this, and then I'll, I'll go back and edit that. And then, yeah, you'll be able to watch the whole thing. Have you ever tried the Damari method of swarm control? I have never tried that. Um, I've read about it before. And, and what I do is um, it's kind of a combination of uh, Walt Wright and uh, just giving them plenty of comb above. Hey, Steve Chubb, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Steve, and for donating and helping us support the experimental yard. It really is going to make a difference, and I appreciate you being a part of that and being so serious about it. So if you have any questions, man, we'll catch you next time. You have a good night. How does it feel when people say that you have a dream job? Um, well... I feel really blessed to be able to do this. I also realized I went through several years of hell to get here. And that was of my own choosing. Um, part of it was because of my own inexperience. Um, but to say that we went through m many years back to back where we did not have like any vacations. We didn't have any Saturdays ever. Uh, a lot of times I didn't have Sundays because my truck driving job made me work weekends and I was working bees during the uh, the week, um, and it really destroyed my gut. Let me tell you, I'm still trying to balance all that back out from um, working those 100-hour work weeks. So um, it, it is a dream job, but th there's a man that said one time, in order to do something, um, to live a life that, uh, wow, that lightning's really going to town, um, to live a life that, Everyone would like to have you have to do things everyone would not want to do or something like that. Um, I, and definitely, I, I feel like that applies to this. So, I mean, it, I definitely love it, and I'm so thankful for it, but it was not just that easy. And the YouTube channel came late in it. Um, it has been a big help. It really has. But um, if, I, if the YouTube channel disappeared tomorrow, I'm, I'm very happy to say that we could keep our bees and still, you know, survive off of that um that was one of that's one of my goals um and has been one of my goals that the youtube channel really just focus on education and going into more education and i need to have the bees to where they actually provide my income um, because you never know youtube gets get shut down change policy whatever i can't depend on that so um i, I i'm I, the bees is the number one thing for me but yeah, I love it. And I hope more of you are able to do it. And even for those of you who don't want to do it on this grand of a scale, I think there's huge opportunities to be that beekeeper in your community that has 10 hives, 50 hives, whatever. But with those 10 hives produce, you know, 80 gallons of honey a year and sell honey. One of the guys coming to our conference January 7th and 8th, which by the way, um, when we announce that will probably be sometime in summer. I highly suggest if you're serious about coming, you get on board with that quickly. From the feedback that I'm getting, we are going to probably sell out in a month or less, maybe a couple weeks. Unfortunately, the biggest room I can get, according um, to current state laws, um, I can hold you know, 500 people, but that includes the vendors. Um, it's really hard to find um, um, good spots um, right now. Everyone's getting back into the whole um, prepping for the future type thing. So I, I really think it's going to go quick, um, but we're going to have a guy there by the name of Greg Rogers, and he runs 400 hives by himself and has for almost as long as I've been alive and is professional beekeeper. We need to learn from this guy. Um, he seems to be a really nice person. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say because it's, it's all fine and dandy, you know, having Ian Steplers out there and Bob Benny's, you know, but they're running crews, these massive operations. A lot of us don't want 
operations that big. So what, you know, I want to talk to Greg about, you know, keeping 200, 400 hives and, and being successful with that and what it takes. I think he's going to really shed a lot of light on that. I would love to see a lot of people do it. Yeah. Do it while you're young. Plain and simple says that is true. I started when I was um, 15. So that helps Tennessee Ronan. Thank you so much for supporting um, us and oh, Canadian beekeepers living the dream. Just don't sleep. <laughs> I remember you saying that, Ian, that that is still funny. Living the dream. Just don't sleep. I, I imagine you don't up there. I wish I could get you down here some spring. I know that it's so busy for you guys, but I wish you could see our Tennessee Springs down here um, or, or or something like that. Uh, maybe one of these years um, you can, you can uh, have, make your kids do all the work. I, I seriously doubt it. Um, but anyways, I hope you're doing good up there, Ian, and things are going, going uh, good for you. Yeah, Ian, 500 people, and you better be there because there's people already asking if they can get an autograph from a Canadian. You know, they, they think that that's special for whatever reason. I don't know why. Um, the B man at, at Faith Apiaries, I was, I watched your video, man. Um, I, I hope everything's looking good for you as well. Is there a conference coming up this year? So, yes, it'll be in Lebanon, Tennessee, January 7th. And okay, this year, I don't have one planned this year. Started beekeeping when you were 12. That, that's a good time to start. So have you ever watched Dr. Samuel Ramsey stuff? Oh, yeah, I have. Um, Dr. Samuel Ramsey is um, kicking butt and taking names in his field. And I have reached out and tried to get him at our conference. Um, but he, he's, you know, he just let me know he's really focused on if he's able to returning to Thailand and working on the tropolapsis mite, which is extremely important. If they, heaven forbid, get over here, we need all the advanced research that we can get. And I think that he's the right guy for it. Obviously, he's, um, I mean, why weren't other people already doing that? So I think, um, I, th I think he's, he's doing some great stuff. Hopefully one day we'll be able to actually have him out here. I would love to be able to have him out here and do, um, do a round table with him. He seems like a, a, a fun guy. Came in some syrup was left in some of my hives. The bees were all on top and, but the, but the, on top and, but the feeder and died. Do you know why that is? So, <coughs> excuse me. So ET's bees, are you talking like a frame feeder and they went in there and drowned or something? Mm. Mm, dinner. Well, you know, there's a lot of variables to feeding. So one of the things is frame feeders don't work really good if the cluster's not big and it's not warm. That syrup gets so cold. I think that's why Ian uses bucket feeders. And a lot of, uh, seems like it's very common up north. It works good in the south too. And we're clustered by the feeder. Well, were you using thick syrup, ET's bees, or were you using thin syrup? So um, next year's conference, um, for the person that asked, um, next year's is January 7th and 8th. Um, there's going to be great vendors there, some bulk pricing on feeds that you can't get anywhere else. We're going to have Ian Stepler there if he won't back out out of um, fear of all of you crazy beekeepers. Now, there's a lot to be afraid of, to be honest. Um, much a weird bag of nuts we are. And uh, plus, we're Americans, mostly by and large, that'll show up to this one as far as uh, USA type. So um, who knows? People might even be packing at this conference. Wouldn't surprise me. It's in Tennessee. Um, seriously, though, uh, we'll have vendors. We're going to, I'm trying to get people to commit. A lot of the companies are still very reluctant to commit to anything. But I already have at least eight people vendor wise coming. And my goal is to have 20 if I can or more. And that way we can have kind of what some of a trade show. So you can see a lot of these products firsthand. You can see how they work, touch them, that kind of thing. A lot of these vendors also give discounts like 10% off. You can also get free shipping. If you pre-order, they'll bring it to the conference. So you can save a lot of money buying equipment. There were some people I really think by the time they added up um, what they bought, 
and the, as much as they shaved on the 10% off and the shipping and stuff, some of them paid for their conference um, just saving on equipment and feeds and stuff like that. So we're going to try to do that again. What would you say is a gentlest breed of bees? I need some queens for my mean bees. Oh, that's that's really hard. You know, I've, I've had some Italians that were really gentle, and I've had some carnies that were really gentle. I've had some Italians that um, knitted my blue jeans to my ankles too. So, you know, and same with the carnies. I, I think typically carnies are a little bit more gentle. Um, I really enjoy my carnies. They're very nice. Jamie O'Brien, planning my next hive. Should I get an apame? Apames work, but but keep in mind, most of my operation is wood hives, and I do like them, but you have to weigh the cost factor in there. You know, a lot of some people, I've actually had some people get really upset with me recommending apame and, and stuff. And um, it's not like I'm going out there and say, you need to buy one. I'm not. One of the biggest lessons you can take from my videos is I review products and show you if they work or if they don't. And then you get to decide what you want to do. But what am I doing? Am I converting my entire operation to Apame? Nope. It's too expensive. Can't afford it. And obviously, I can keep my bees alive without them. I still think they're cool. Love their pollen trap board. I'm still waiting to hear back to for verification on the code um, from Apame because they, they've told me they're going to do a collaboration with me. I know that they will. They're just, they're having a lot of issues right now because of the, uh, the storm that hit down in Texas. So this is the crazy thing, right? The, the products are made with U S grade materials that shipped to Turkey, made in Turkey, and then shipped back to the United States. The problem is Texas was hit hard and all this coronavirus stuff, prices have gone way up. So I'm supposed to be doing a giveaway on their pollen trap, but I think they have some, their products are good. Bees will survive in it. They'll also survive in a tire. They'll also survive in a lot of things if the conditions are met. So um, I, as a business, I, you know, it, you have to decide. I think they're going to last a long time. From what I've been able to see, my hives are going to last a very long time, my Apame hives. And the bees have done well in them. But they also did well in my polystyrene, and they did well in my wooden hives as well. What about startups? Um, yeah, for Apame. I mean, you can, sure. Um, I think it's a better investment than a flow hive. You get a lot more out of it. It's going to last longer. Um, you get insulation. Um, you know, they're, they're really good. So, again, um, the only negative I would say with the Apame hive is if you don't like plastic, they're food grade plastic. And if you don't, um, you know, want to pay that kind of price, you can use wood, but they do work really well. And anyone that tells you that bees don't like plastic hives, obviously have never used an Apame hive before. Hey, Terry Floyd, I am selling some nukes. Um, I haven't put the word out yet. Um, I, I, I have some already going. Um, once I, once they're ready, I'm gonna gonna deal with that. Um, if you want to send me an email, um, we might be able to sign a few people up on off of here. Um, not selling as many this year. I think at the most I'm gonna sell 100, and um, just focus more on raising queens and uh, and hopefully a little more honey this year. I got some more stores wanting honey. And obviously for the, the test yard, 26 of the colonies are going to be Apame hives. So I wouldn't be using them if they didn't work. Have you noticed Man Lake getting better with shipping? I haven't noticed Man Lake getting better with anything, but, um, you know, we, we can always hope. But a lot of the companies are struggling right now. They can't even get enough wood for all their products. It's going to be another frustrating year. I've said this before. I'll say it again. I highly recommend if you need something in 2021, you order it in November or December of 2020. That's what I do on 90 something percent of all everything that I buy every year is I order it the winter but before the spring that I'm going to need it. It works wonderfully. And it seems like no matter what year it is, whether it's coronavirus stuff or not, something is going to get in the way of production. They'll find some excuse. And it's always a pain getting stuff in spring. Is it okay to reuse the box after it's set for a year after cleaning, cleaning it up? I would imagine it would be. Um, unless it has American Foul Brood, I reuse everything. Let's see. 
Brian Reese, still waiting on my green frames that I bought at the conference. Are, are you serious? Wow. Well, maybe we'll run into each other. I've got some spares you can have. Um, let's see. Um, Hi-Fi, don't buy Man Lake boxes. Just got some nothing fit. And Don Summers... Um, uh, which um, they have a YouTube channel, um, be keeping like a girl. They're not too impressed with the quality either. I wasn't on the last 300 boxes I brought, bought from Man Lake, and I've got some people ticked off with me over there, but it's not my fault that they're doing a poor job with their boxes. I am totally cool with praising anybody who makes good beekeeping equipment. I really try not to take sides. I'm just on the side of beekeeping, and if you do good, you're good. If you do bad, you're terrible. And I'll tell you, it's not just because um, he donated stuff to me, but when I show you the boxes that I got from Hillco, you can find them at Hillco, like .com or whatever it is, just H-I-L-L-Co.com. And I got some boxes made by them, USA-made boxes. Oh, my goodness. I haven't seen boxes with joints that tight and nice since Kelly's 15 years ago. It was a... Uh, it was nice to see. The frames were really good too, but the boxes were really nice. And wow, they all sat on each other without rocking and stuff like that. I was really impressed with uh, the 52 boxes that he brought down here in the 520 frames. And you'll get to see them once the test yard starts and see the quality for yourself. Definitely better than anything I got from Man Lake on the last order. All righty here. Well, the thing is, Man Lake has more uh, capabilities of making the highest quality boxes. But um, one thing I got from Hillco that well, he he brought me down as a, a gift. Um, he gave me a smoker, and as all of you know, that I like to use the Dadents, right? Uh, this smoker is the nicest thing that I've used since a Dadent, and it's cheaper. Um, actually, in some areas, it's stronger than a Dadent. I was pretty surprised. Um, I've used it twice and it just stays lit and it keeps going. I mean, it works wonderfully. Um, so now I've got three datants in that smoker too. I've got four smokers. Um, but can you, you, you can't have too many smokers. You really can't as long as they're good. I actually maliciously destroyed one of my smokers. Um, once upon a time, Bruce Brown, have you used the hive lifter? I've actually filmed a little bit of it for a video and there will be, there definitely will be, um, Um, videos coming up on that soon. Tennessee Ronan, do you happen to be in Jackson County? I'm just curious. I'm just curious if I know who you are. Let's see. Can we prepay for the conference? Not yet, Will. I will be announcing that soon. I'll have multiple videos on it. But again, um, I, I'm going to say that it's it's going to sell out in the first month. Um at the latest. Okay. Okay. Cook Phil. I think I know who you are. There's crazy people around there. I tell you, but no, um, yeah, it is. It's going to be in, in Jackson County. Um, and it is, by the way, um, I'm going to have a, um, surveillance on that yard. Just FYI. So, um, not that I think any of you are going to do that, but I'm starting to put cameras in my B yards. It's one of my concerns with, uh, this whole YouTube thing. I'm getting phone calls and and different things and people showing up, and I really don't appreciate that. I, I, the phone calls is one thing, but the people showing up unannounced, um, I don't care for that at all. Uh, look for me at the last meeting. Okay. You know, I really don't ever have time to come to the B clubs um, in Cookville. Um, I wish I did. Um, I used to many years ago. But um, holy smokes, that was a big one. You guys are getting some lightning over there towards Cookville. That's what you're getting right now. May I ask when you will have your queens? Also, website. Thank you for your time. Laurel's almost got the website up, and I should have queens. Oh, I've got queens going right now, so um, we always give them at least three weeks to lay. So, you know, we're, we're looking at the end of April before we have any queens to sell. Um, I might have a... Um, I might have a couple before then, um, but the, the early round, a lot of times I, I want to evaluate 
And a lot, sometimes I need the early round for myself. Um, and, and we're also using some of the early round for making nukes and, and things. So as far as actually having bees to sell, a queens to sell, it'll be the end of the month. Let's see. Let's see. It's 9.22 p.m. and my bees are bearded up underneath the bottom screen board. Five-frame nuke and a 10-frame hive. Should I take the plastic wax coated foundation out and recoat them with more beeswax? Um, you could if you think that it really needs it. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes with the screen bottom boards, the bees just um, will do that. They'll get confused a little early on. One thing um, I, I kind of like on, on young colonies I, I like to section off that um that screen bottom board. Hang on one sec. Because uh, young colonies really need to control that that cluster as much as they can. I don't really like having screen bottom boards on young colonies. That's just my opinion. Um, I prefer solids. So one uh, one of the things um people saw me using um making my pallets with um, cheap dog-eared um, boards that are pretty cheap from Lowe's and stuff. I, I wouldn't recommend doing that again. FYI, if anybody watched those videos, um, I switched to making my pallets over to CDX plywood. I'll use Advantech if I can get a good cheap price on it, but you, you don't find cheap prices on it, um, unless a lumberyard uh, I, a construction company is getting rid of some, but I don't really like that stuff. Yeah, polystyrene. My polystyrene boxes did really good um, as well. I the uh, the Apamaes did a little bit better, but I don't think it had to do with the type of material that they were in. I think it had more to do with the condition the bees were going into winter. Um, if you can call what we had a winter. Let's see. Yeah, exactly. Well, hi fi yeah, premium grade. Um, it, it's true. Well, and one of the things that we all need to do, and I need your help with this, is we've got to work together as an individual, as one person. I can't hardly do anything. I can't make any major headway. That's for sure. But all of us working together, we can make big differences and beekeepers have got to take back the control on, on things. It's not that. Um, the researchers haven't done their job, but they're researchers and the PhDs, you know, the researchers that they, they have their area of expertise. The beekeepers though, our job is to make sure that we are providing good education and being careful what we're sharing with one another. And we're also encouraging the right type of development into young beekeepers, whether, you know, they're 60 years old and it's their first year, whether they're 10 years old. But the main thing I need help with, and we all need help with, is buy, finding and maybe even spending a tiny bit more money buying from people who actually give a whatever about beekeepers. There are companies out there, and you know who they are, and they don't care at all. And they're big, and they are willing. They don't care what they, they'll sell you. The, the customer service is almost completely gone. The only reason I deal with these big companies is because they have products that some of the little guys don't have, but more and more I'm putting my money into people that I know. And that's one of the things that when I go to, um, you know, John Hill came down here with Hill Kobe's and he showed me the boxes that he has. And the one thing that I knew after talking to him for about two hours, that he was the type of person that was not going to settle with a customer being less than satisfied. And it was, it was a personal goal of him, uh, of his to do that. And there are a lot of people like him, Hat B Acres. They're good people. They're families. Um, they can't do everything. And I realize we still have to have these big companies, but if we're to see these big companies shape up, they've got to feel more pressure financially or go away and let some of these young bucks become the big companies and hopefully keep on the right path. But we all have got to to work towards that. I know it's I know it's not easy, just starting out. But um, if you're around the Tennessee area, if you're around Hillco Bee Supply, I would go there. I tell you that right now. It's up in Illinois. They can ship. Uh, there's Amish suppliers. There is Hat Bee. 
acres in Ohio. There's a lot of companies around the country. We need to communicate better about these things and support the companies that actually care and help make them more successful. So it helps us because we definitely need somebody, some, some companies out there that actually care. I feel like I'm, I'm getting more new stuff out of country that looks cool than made in the U.S. And I, it's really ticking me off. Do you sell your bees in the nuke the day before you sell them? Um, no, um, I don't. My, my nukes are so strong um, when I sell them that I can't do that. They'll overheat sometimes. So we literally um, shut the nukes up that morning and we put them in the shade. And if it's really hot in the jester nuke boxes, we'll cut out that little um, plug that they have up there for a feed a feeder and we'll put a window screen over it and then tape it down. And, and that really helps. Yeah. Don't show up to Cayman's house. He's a hillbilly and probably has a gun. I don't know if I would call myself a hillbilly. Um, definitely the hillbillies around here wouldn't call me that, but I see what you're trying to say there. Um, I would be more concerned about my wife. She's a crack shot and she's um, shy and doesn't like company. So um, don't get on her wrong side. You might get me shot in the process. So you better not. Um, but no, no, Laurel, no, Laurel's nice. She wouldn't do that to you. She, maybe me. <laughs> what grade of, grade of oh, man this thing just jumped on me doggone technology golly every now and then like this is bar it, it freezes and then i i click it and it, it like refreshes and i'll like jump like a hundred questions down doggone it okay here we go here we go what grade of boxes do you get from Man Lake? So the last time that I purchased from Man Lake, I got commercial grade. And I expect commercial grade to have knots in them. I expect them to have maybe some planar marks where it dug down too deep. You expect to see some issues. I don't expect perfection. I don't expect them to have you know that big of a gap in between the box below them and th that box that they are. And uh, I definitely don't expect there to be them to be extremely hard to put together. And when you pound them in, the wood's peeling out because it physically can't go in at the size that it, it, it is. Um, it, they're just, uh, the wood's too green. They, they didn't kill and dry them right. I don't think it's the cutting so much as they're not kill and dry right, but th there's also some cutting issues as well. I don't expect perfection. I don't care if there's knots in the boxes. They just need to be sound. They need to sit on each other f properly and they need to, not have huge gaps in the joints. Shoot, some of those things have gaps that are way bigger than a 16th of an inch. It's just crazy. You can go to the Amish guy and they're using literally a horse for power and making better boxes. What in the world? Let's see. Okay. Back down to where we were. Hey, Cayman, just up the road from you in Cumberland County, below freezing temperature, overnight temperatures predicted several nights this week. Can you talk a little on the effects that this will have on the spring buildup? Okay, this is really common for us and maybe a lot of other areas as well. It's frustrating because sometimes it takes out the black locust, and I'd say fit only about 50% of the time do we actually get black locust in my area. But that's kind of just expected. Last year was bad because we had just, days and days of cold rainy weather and the bees just didn't fly period it's one thing to have a few days of freezing like that and yes you lose some crops but if you only lose maybe a week's worth then you know it's a week but we were we lost i'd say last year four weeks worth of foraging and that really was a gut punch to the bees and, and to um, our bottom line and several of you um, helped us out donating and i really appreciate you any of you who are watching that did um, but how that's going to affect us is it's probably going to take out the black locust. And if it's hard enough and late enough, it'll damage the tulip poplar, which is a bummer. That's not the end of the world. Again, kind of like I just explained, um, black locust is a nice premium crop and tulip poplar is not my favorite, but it does add in some years, some bulk. Um, I don't really count on either one of those, um, as being a big, um, deal. The most important thing that I find is always have my bees ready to go. As long as it's not an atrocious year like last year, the bees will still do good. Um, how will this affect spring buildup on the big powerful colonies? If it's just a short little period like this, I think they'll be okay. I think they'll be just fine. Um, if they were going to have 
you know, it's, it's going to get up like some of those days where it's getting down to 29, it's getting up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit and it's sunny and other days it's getting warm. So the bees are still able to get out, do cleansing flights. They're able to go get pollen and whatever else is out there. And, and that really helps last year. Again, they weren't able to do that. And nutritionally, they just burn through their resources, pollen and everything. I had colonies that burned through all their honey and it was April and I was having to emergency feed in April. What in the world? And uh, just to keep them from going majorly backwards. So I doubt we'll have that this year. Um, the weaker colonies, just watch watch them. But I, I think they'll be okay. It doesn't look too bad to me. I'm not too worried about what I'm seeing with the weather forecast. All right. Yeah, um, as, pa as, par as far as... Man, I'm starting to slip up here. As far as polystyrene hives go superior b makes polystyrene boxes in the u.s and i've never tried them but they're supposed to be good so you know if you like to go that route then there's that option getting my first nuke from annie next week well that that should be really exciting and um sounds like you're you're pretty close so your your timing is going to be basically exactly like mine yeah, Hillco Extractors Rock. Um, I've Hillco actually left an extractor with me. Um, it was one of their um, larger ones, and I'm going to be doing a review on it. That was part of the agreement of them sponsoring the... Um, he didn't make me agree to do it. I said I would be willing to. And um, he asked if I would be, and I said yes. Um, I mean, when the, uh, somebody donates 52 hives assembled and 52 frames assembled, and then comes down here helps me pop the premier foundation in um i'm pretty inclined to um help them out a little bit and uh you know i think john is a class act and so we're going to be looking at that and um yeah the extractors seem really well built if it's anything like that um, smoker from hilco i'm i'm going to be impressed yeah melissa's harvest the boxes from albert zook are fantastic um, I purchased, um, 30 of those supers actually. Um, I needed a few more, um, honey supers and a buddy of mine brought them up and we dipped them and who, yeah, they look good. Let's see. Aloha from the big Island. All right. I mean, I kind of missed the big Island. I, I was in there in January and man, the food, oh, the food. Let's see. What's nice is when you have a family of hundreds of acres and they plant for deer season hunts, the bees love it. Hey, yes, they do. One of the things I think in Tennessee and areas like us could be really beneficial is to um, plant sunflowers and clover right before the end of your flow. Um, our dearths typically in this area are in late June, July, and August. So if you plant a bunch of good sunflowers and I like I'm, what I'm going to try this year, and I think this makes perfect sense. We'll see if it works out is we're going to plant an understory of clover and sunflowers all in one shot. And of course the sunflowers are going to grow through that. And the, the sun, the clover is going to keep the weeds down and we'll get pollens and nectars from both of those. And hopefully achieve a couple weeks of nutrition for the bees. Definitely not enough to harvest planting, you know, a couple acres, but if it can just de-stress our bees and help them stay healthy, totally worth it. And, um, I'm going to try that out and hopefully have some videos on that this year. Let's see. Yeah. Um, the prices are really good. Now keep in mind, um, you know, unlike Dadents, they're not made in the USA. I'm trying, I'm trying to be very honest and you know, some of the products aren't, but keep in mind, most, you know, Man Lakes extractors aren't made in the USA. Most products are not anymore. And there are some USA-made products that unfortunately are garbage. Um, we have really, as, especially as a beekeeping industry, we've, we've slid backwards. And a lot of these young companies like Hillco and Hat Bee Acres, um, they've, got to, they've got to buy from, you know, just to compete with these big guys, they have to. And I to it totally makes sense to me. Um, you can only do so much. So, um, and, and there's some things made overseas that are extremely high quality. So we're going to check that out and do a review on that this year. And if it works good, it looks good. Um, 
if it works good, then um, we'll let you know and you'll get to see it in action, processing lots of honey, hopefully. Hopefully. John Stevens, your black locust is blooming. It, it's not here right now, um, but it might be starting to in some areas of Tennessee. Um, I hope it's not thinking about it. If it is, it's fixing to get nipped in the bud. Every time I hear that, I think of Barney Fife. Hope Sadler, top box of my best hive, had multiple capped swarm cells. Left queen in the bottom and took the top box off. Should I move cells with bees and brood to triple mating box I made from your video or leave in box? Okay. Top box of best hive had multiple capped swarm cells. Left queen and bottom and took top box off. Well, Hope, I'm just um, keep in mind, maybe you splitting like that will be enough to retard that tendency. There is a fine line there. Sometimes if the queen's still laying hard, she hasn't, they haven't committed all the way yet, but she still might swarm in a situation like that. Even if you take those bees in the cells, she still might swarm. Maybe not. I say 50-50. If you wanted to, be careful with the cells and don't shake them and all that kind of stuff. But if you want, if there's multiple frames with cells, you could take and make a, another small split. And it might not be a bad idea because if you had two colonies with cells as opposed to just one, you have a better chance of having at least one come back and a halfway decent chance of both of them coming back. Um, hopefully that'll work out really good for you. Sw swarming outside of mites. That, that's the thing. I usually have a hard time getting people to um, focus on mites. And once they get that program down, then their bees usually, if they're you know doing like have a decent queen and they they the bees have the nutrition they need, then the next biggest hurdle is swarm control. It is it's a big issue and it's not an easy fix if you don't have combs. And even if you do, it takes some experience. I, I suggest doing some research into swarm control methods out there. The Damari method work and, and Walt Wright's um, method work, but um, they really work well, again, just like everything that I've kind of said with drawn comb. Um, keep me posted if, on the next live chat if you're on it, Hope Sadler, how that turned out for you, if you would. I'm always trying to learn more about that. Let's see here. Well, I've seen some of Man Lake's extractors, and um, you do. I I don't want anything to do with the the medium to small size uh, medium uh, Man Lake extractors. I don't like the quality. I don't like the the little motors. Um, now they're bigger ones. I don't know how good they are, um, but I'm not a huge fan of uh, what I've seen out of the. 12 and and keep in mind you've got to also read these things um call beforehand on these extractors you have to be careful like max says you know we've got a 20 frame extractor well the one that i've seen it does 20 medium frames but it doesn't it only does so many deep frames whereas if you get a 20 frame extractor from dadent or maybe somebody else you can do 20 deep frames and 20 mediums actually you can stack more mediums in there than that so you have to watch these extractors i um, and, and I always, before purchasing something of that expense, I would call and, and see what they have to say about it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Hi-Fi. I, you know, I didn't really want to recommend Hilco before I saw the boxes firsthand. I was, I was very appreciative of his donation. I mean, obviously it was free and all the work he put into it. I appreciated that, but you know, I don't want to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, Hillco's going to sponsor us. Buy from him, buy from him, buy from him. And then I, I the boxes get here, and they're even worse than Man Lakes or something like that. But I've been really in, impre impressed. Merry Christmas 2.0. I saw the one um, earlier. I might have missed that last one. Um, let's see here. Ah, sorry, I missed that one. Sorry. The, the thing jumps around on me. I didn't even see that one at all. Man Lake wouldn't wear his junk. How do I find Amish? Okay. Well, that is the question. Um, they can be hard to get a hold of, but uh, if you have a bunch of good chewing tobacco, some of them will come out of the woods, no problem. Um, in all seriousness, there is some in Franklin, Tennessee, and there are some in uh, Franklin, Kentucky, and there is some in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. You can look them up. Um, you know what? I'll try to post that at some point. 
But if you look it up online, I'll bet you'll find the information. If you go to the Tennessee um, Beekeepers page on Facebook, um, a lot of times they talk about it there. Maybe somebody will leave. Of course, they don't have a website or a phone number. You have to actually send a, a letter to them and they can send you prices. Some people have prices online. I'll see if I can find them. But the prices are extremely fair and the stuff is better. But there is also other Amish. And so if anybody else know of good suppliers out there, you know, um, feel free. But um, I think they're, I, I heard of one in Ohio as well. Let's see. When we have a topic for bee venom collection, I don't know anything, Harley. I know just enough about bee venom to be dangerous, so I don't talk about that, that's for sure. Let's see. Do you have a solution for a nectar-locked hive? The best solution is not to let it happen in the first place, and I know that's, that's not really helpful, but that is... That is the best case. Um, if you don't have drawn combs, then you're kind of out of luck. Um, you can shake the bees out on the foundation and force them to draw something. But then what are you going to do with the other stuff that you have? You can put it on, put it in the freezer, put it on back later, but you have brood in there. Um, it's, it's really difficult. Drawn combs are gold. They, they are almost as valuable as the bees are. All right. So Eric, Cunningham um, posted Peter Zook, 1617 Stevenson Road, Franklin, Kentucky. We're looking at a, a license 20. We'll be interested in your Hillco review. I would love to see more with license um, as well. And let me tell you, I um, Hillco is going to be there at our conference. So he's planning on bringing extractors and all kinds of stuff. So you'll get to see the quality of this stuff. And I'm, I'm impressed with it so far. I haven't run any honey through it though. Um, but I, John seems to be a really honest, good person. And I think he'd have a hard time sleeping at night if the product was not up to, um, a satisfying level to the customer. Um, but I'm hoping to also have a, a license dealer or two at the conference as well. License has some good products and I'm going to have them there if I can. Well, sorry about that, um, uh, Salpta. It's 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 just it, it's that way, and I've been in that position so so many times. It's frustrating. Are you going to have the Amish woodworkers at your conference, John? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if they're willing to make that long of a trip in January in their buggies. Unfortunately, I don't think they'll let me drive either. Um, it probably take them two days in a buggy. <laughs> Uh, they, they won't be there. Um, but I am planning on actually having some quality wax dipped equipment. Um, I might be actually working with one of these sponsors for getting um, bulk boxes and wax dipping them and bringing them to the conference. And so they're just completely assembled, wax dipped, and ready to last for decades. Speaking of drawn comb, what can I do with the dead out uncapped nectar and no freezer? Can I put out for robbing stations made for swarm boxes or nukes? Um, you can. Uh, in the state of Tennessee, you are legally not supposed to let them rob things out. However, I think most Tennesseans are rebels. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, uh, getting those combs dry is important. When... Um, Greg Burns was here with the contrary beekeepers podcast doing, um, the interview with me just the other day, he was asking me, how am I keeping, you know, hundreds and hundreds of combs stored? I, I literally have thousands actually of drawn combs sitting in my shed, not covered up. The only thing that I protect them from is mice. I don't want mice to get in there and make nests, but they're dry though. There is literally nothing but there, but dry comb, no bee bread, no nothing. I have no issues with wax moss getting into those. There's ventilation that can circulate through them and they're protected from mice. So if you can get them to that stage somehow, that would really help you out. Came okay, and I have some hives with frames of honey that have turned to rock candy. Should I pull them? Um, if the bees need them, they will break that down at some point. Um, but you can pull them. Um, I hate it when that happens. I have a few hives like that. I, I, I'll probably have like 10 deeps worth, maybe 15 deeps worth of 
um, hives that I've pulled frames of just stores from um, honey slash sugar syrup stores. And it's hard to know what to do with this stuff. I don't have a walk-in freezer yet. One of these days I'm going to have it and uh, not, not this year, not next year, but uh, let the bees, I think in Kentucky, you can, can you let bees uh, rob those out? Maybe that would be good. Um, if they'll even take it this time of the year. And the nectar is sugar water. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and one thing, if you have the time and if it's like honey thickness, um, if it's already honey thickness, you can extract that out and you can actually store that in buckets and use that to make pollen patties or feed back to bees. I love using thick syrup like that for pollen patties. Um, so that, that's one option. Yeah. Tennessee is highly regulated. I'm, I'm, of course, you know, Hi-Fi, that I'm working on working on Tennessee's regulations. So hopefully we can make some progress long term. Yeah, so you can't get the bees to rob the frames, uh, Blanchard B says. And that's right now there's a trickle of nectar coming in some places. And it's it's interesting. I mean, if we're in middle of June, late June, you stick out a frame like that. And I mean, it's just right. You can't even see the frame for all the bees on it. And this time of the year, they won't even look at it. Do you have any, do you have anyone that are using lay-ins hives? I know a friend of mine who's using a lay-ins hive, um, just a few miles from me and he likes it all right, but, um, you know, they die in it just like, uh, my hives do, um, you know, and other types of hives, they, the bees still have to be in good health to survive in them. I think there's some, there's some merits to it. I personally like something that's a little bit more traditional, but they, I think the bees will survive in them just fine if they're healthy. Um, it's, it's one of those things, you know, it, you, if you like it, it'll totally work. But um, the best hive in the world can't be, uh, keep, can't keep sick bees alive. Does Tennessee have a hive registration program? What are your thoughts on such a program? Tennessee does have a hive registration program. And I think registration programs are dumb. Um, I think the government needs to, in all areas, beekeeping included, shrink back about 90%. But, you know, oh boy, here I'm, I'm getting political. <laughs> but what do I know? I'm, in, I'm a white male in the country. So that being said, uh, the government, whenever they get involved, I think a lot of these programs, literally, they, they start with good intentions. But you know what they say about the um, the road to hell and, and good intentions, and uh, you know there's too many regulations. It, it stifles business here in Tennessee. Ninety nine percent of our equipment, our used equipment, is perfectly disease free. New beekeepers that need that, like I have some drawn combs out there, and I have some old boxes that are used. They're they're in great shape with a, another coat of paint. They probably last ten more years. The combs would be great. I illegally can't sell those to you. They, they could be a lifesaver. They could save somebody money. Give them that comb, that headspace. Can't do it. And there are tons of professionals who can't. And they go out of state and they don't move into the state of Tennessee or stay here because if they do, business is hard. Government loves destroying small businesses, whether they realize it or not. And these regulations make it hard. Do we need some regulations and laws yeah we do need a little bit but um american foul brood is the number one reason they're so tight and it's you hardly see it and it's almost always brought in from uh, somebody out of the state and we do need some regulations on that outside of that i say forget it let's see oh thanks palmer brothers for the donation i really appreciate that i'm i and it's not just because i'm the one putting on i'm i'm super excited Super excited about what we're going to learn from this test yard, and not just this year. Next year, it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be a blast. And uh, these these treatments that we have available, how many of you on here can tell me how to universally keep your mites low legally and uniformly year to year? Is there a, a recipe out there? I don't think you can fully get it perfect because obviously what you do in Tennessee won't work up in Ian Stepler land, but 
there's just too many variables and too many questions, way more questions than answers. And, you know, I'm talking to guys who have way more experience than me, and they're still trying to solve this puzzle. We've, as beekeepers, we've got to get to the bottom of this for our own sakes and for our bee sakes. And I think there's answers out there and things that are working good for me. I think this experimental yard will shed more light on why they work. Maybe ways that I can tweak them and make them better, which will affect my bottom line. Okay, so how do I deal with Nozema? Um, how do I deal with European fowl brood? So, oh, hey, Yuri, you're moving to North Carolina next door from California. Why would you do that for? I have no idea why you do that. Um, you know, and I, I totally get it. There are tons of people moving to the state of Tennessee. I have no problem with people moving here as long as they leave the ideas behind and most people, most of them are, I mean, I'm not from the state of Tennessee. I am not. My dad was from Alabama. Mom was from Indiana. Things change. People move, but we've, you know, it's what makes Tennessee and some of these States awesome to live in is the fact that our government policies are not stupidly strict. I can build 50 outhouses behind my house and you know what? The locals are going to say about that, that guy is weird. You do that in some parts and out west and other places, and you're going to have to pay thousands just to be able to put that outhouse back there, much less 50 of them. 50 outhouses does seem excessive. But, you know, if I put on a conference at my place someday, they might come in handy. Um, okay, getting back to the European foul brood and Nozema. European fowl brood is number one genetics for me. I really believe this is something that can be controlled by genetics primarily. We, if a colony shows a lot of European fowl brood and the, the mites aren't an issue, the nutrition is not an issue. It's the queen's fault. She, she goes eliminate. It doesn't care if she's two months old. It doesn't, I don't care how old she is. I will not stand European fowl brood in colonies. There's no reason to especially when you can raise your own Queens, you just, you, you just burn it. You burn it out. And so to speak. And, um, and it works last year was the worst European fowl brood I've had in years. And we had a terrible season, um, early on cause it was cold and rainy. Nutrition was poor, but as soon as it fixed itself, um, as far as the nutrition and the temperatures, the bees cleaned it right on back up. They had the genetics and the capability to do that. Some bees are not able to do that with European fowl brood or chalk brood. I consider that a bee genetic problem. It's one thing to see it for a little while and it to clean itself up. It's one thing to have it just sustained, especially in periods where it shouldn't be around. <coughs> Excuse me. As far as Nozema, that's something I, I'm going to look into a little bit more. Uh, I don't really focus a lot on Nozema here. A lot of people don't in Tennessee. And one of the parts with this test yard is I would like to look into that more and find out what my Nozema levels are. Are they affecting me more than I think that they are? Um, it would be definitely a good area to look into. Um, we need to know these things. And so um, it's important. What are you looking at me for like that? Am I being goofy again? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Laurel heard that I was talking political stuff again. Uh-oh. The, the producer is going, hey, keep it down. Keep it down. By the way, this, this video is brought to you by and produced by and made possible by Laurel Reynolds. <laughs> but yeah, for, for Nozema and all that stuff, primarily I just focus on Great queens, dead mites, and good nutrition. And that works really good for me. But I'm getting at the point where I feel like I can tie, you know, tighten that up a little bit. Am I losing a small percentage of bees or are my clusters coming through winter, coming out of winter a little bit smaller because I'm not focused on Nozema at all? And I'm just focused on those three things. Where can I kind of tighten things in and make my business more efficient and make my bees healthier? Oh. Oh yeah. Oh, 
Yeah, Laurel's uh, got some new merchandise. This is great. Queen's Dead Mites and Good Nutrition. We, we threw that up, and um, we're going to keep tweaking that. Hopefully, have some cool stuff at the conference. I thought about a shirt. I don't know. What do you guys think about this? Having a shirt at the conference, since Bob Benny's going to be there, that says, Be Like Bob. What do you think about that? I, I think if we... It, yeah. B-E-E, -E, like Bob. And... uh that wouldn't wouldn't that be a cool shirt? I think I would wear that, and we could get a bunch of people. Bob would be probably so embarrassed if I. Maybe we could do it to Ian Stepler. That would be funny. <coughs> mm. Do you recommend feeding sugar syrup to help when splitting? Okay, great question. So, when we make splits, even in spring during premium times of the year we are still feeding those splits. When you make a split and you move, you have it in the same yard, all the forager bees go back. What do you think's happening? All those nurse bees are focused on that brood and, and it depends on how strong you make your splits. But if they don't have enough bees to forage for a little while and keep the brood warm and feed the brood, then nutritionally they're going to go backwards. We always take our splits and we feed them thin syrup. We're not trying to bulk them up. We're just trying to sustain them. So some thin syrup, no thicker than one-to-one. -one. You can even go a little thicker. And then I feed them a little bit of pollen patty, even if pollen is plentiful. A small little bit. For a little nuke, we might be talking less than a quarter pound, eighth of a pound, something like that. But it really helps. See how they consume it. If they consume it fast, maybe do it again. Um, you know, a week later, help those colonies out that first round of brood on young colonies and, and colonies coming out of winter is always the most critical and help those little colonies out. Um, that little bit of feeding really makes a difference. Just watch it though. If you have a, if a really good nectar flow coming in and then they, all those nurse bees that you put in there and that brood merges becomes forager bees. They might be bringing in tons of nectar, and if you're feeding on top of that and they can take it both, they will, and then you can plug out your colony. So it, it's kind of a fine line to walk, but I, I definitely, whenever we make our splits and our nukes or anything like that to sell, they're, they're getting fed even during prime times of the year. It just kind of helps smooth out any gaps, especially on those bad weeks where you get a lot of rain or the temperatures dip down. Oh, um, where, where is that? Oh, being like Ian. Oh my goodness. I, I, if, th this, uh, this just might happen. It might happen. The sheriff just called, just the sheriff just call came in. Dude, you have a website? I've looked, I don't have a website. Um, I, I we're working on one. It's just, it's, we don't really have the time for that kind of stuff. I'm, I really need to pay somebody. I just, uh, it's, I don't have time to even deal with somebody to do that. I do pay you Laurel. You get to spend every day with me. I mean, that's the gift that keeps on giving. Come on, come on. Jeez. Tough crowd. I have to start sh shelling out some more money. Apparently, <laughs> go go with the Ian shirt, please. That that would being like Ian and be like Bob. Maybe we can have all of that, and um, it, it's gonna it's gonna be great. A lot of great speakers. It's gonna be great. Let's see. I know I missed something up here. I missed a lot of stuff. So um, one of the things that I, I like to talk about real quick, um, it came and put all the pros names on the shirt. Um, I might do that. Seriously, talking about that. Are there any issues with using Apivar while queen rearing via grafting? Um, you can. Um, I would be concerned that it would affect the colony. Apivar does slightly affect brood rearing. So if you had Apivar strips in there while you're raising queens, that might affect the queen cells. I haven't seen research on this and, you know, if, it's, it's, if it was for your own personal queens and you felt like their mites were high and they needed to be dealt with, then um, then that might it might be worth it. You definitely don't want to lose that hive. 
So um, that's you have to kind of leave that up to your yourself. Um, I, I the queens that we sell or the ones that I use for myself, I really try to avoid treating. I know some professionals use more gentle treatments like uh, a hop guard three. They, they don't say it gives them really wonderful results, but it's something. Um, keep in mind, though, crazy dirt, that if you're using a queen rearing system via grafting and you don't have any brood in there, um, maybe just capped brood. But if you wait for that capped brood to emerge, you can do an oxalic acid vapor treatment or two while they're broodless in that setup, and you're you're good. Just depends on what type of a starter finisher you're using. If it has a lot of brood in there, that won't work. But um, if you use a queenless and broodless starter, um, you'll get a great kill. So I'm making queens right now, Pat Roop. Um, totally. Um, Bob on the front and Ian on the back. Uh, that'd be funny. Um, but we got all of our speakers lined up. I'm super excited. I'm, I'm excited to listen to these guys. That's what I'm, I'm more excited about this conference than anything is that when I listen to these guys, I know I'm going to get something out of this. And, and it's not that like I'm at an elite level where I can't learn from people. It's just, you get to a certain point where it's harder to find it, new things to learn. And you've got to find people who are better than you or have more years into beekeeping. And a lot of conferences, um, don't focus on such hardcore successful beekeeping. Um, for lack of a better term, th th there's been like a big movement since the early 2000s of like hands off beekeeping. I really don't like it. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you're a beekeeper. You keep bees. Now, some people want that, and that's fine. But that's definitely not the stuff that I talk about, and it's definitely not the stuff that any of these guys talk about. But that's been really highly promoted, and I think that's by and large because the the hands-off beekeeping crowd um, have been better at internet and making doing using book sales and r typing in forums and Facebook groups and all that kind of stuff. And more guys like uh, Bob and Ian are taking the time out of their day to to help us all out. And I'm excited. Um, but a lot of these conferences seem to lean more towards that. Um, or, or that's just, it's research and research is great, but I want to learn how to keep my bees alive and as good as possible. And the, the fellows we have at our conference this year, may be some of the best in the world. I, I'm super blessed. Yeah. Politics equals Cayman's new black eye. That, that was a bee sting. Wheeze bees. That was a bee sting. Well, and you know, there's a balance there. I mean, obviously, like when the bees decide to swarm, we're not, it's not like we. I can stop that. I can do things to try to basically split them and basically they're like, all right, we've we divided, we've conquered. But there's certain things that you, you cannot, you've got to go along with the bees' nature and you've got to understand it. And the hands-off beekeeping approach, I really feel like really pushes the not understanding how bees work and oh this queen um you know has been wonderful you know she's she's from a treatment free line so automatically that means these queens are going to uh, these bees are going to be treatment free and i don't have to worry about mites now oh my bees died well all the it's all showing all the classic signs of varroa deaths but um you know obviously it had to have been european foul brood or wax moss that's that's what killed this colony mhm mm uh oh, hey Laurel's commenting. Uh oh, we're uh, everyone. You better mind your p's and q's. Get me in trouble. I had so Mark says I had most of my grafted queens stop laying as soon as I put ape of R in. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me um, that they geared back or, or shut down. I'm sure it plays an effect on the colony. I agree on the Laurel's rule shirt. For those of you who came to the conference, was it not funny um, to watch uh, me scrambling around like a headless chicken and Laurel having to come in there and save the day? That's that's my life in a nutshell. I have I have a few talents. Um, you, what are you giggling in there about spying again? I see. Anyways, yeah, she uh, she saves my bacon on. You know, some people like she says you're 
you shave your rear end on a daily basis. I'm like hourly, hourly. Um, Landon, you got those queens up for sale yet? My dollar's been burning a hole in my pocket. Wait, <laughs> uh, keep on me, Landon. I, I'll, I will let you know as soon as I have some queens ready. Um, it, it'll probably be sometime late April, early May, and um, we got to make sure they're good. Yeah, got to make sure they're good. This hasn't been the earliest spring for us. It hasn't been the latest. Hat B acres, Bob spelled backwards is Bob. Um, I was talking to Bob the other day. He's just such a nice guy. I'm going to go down and see him in uh, April, mid April and uh, pick up some stuff from him. Um, some of um, Queens. Um, Cause I always like trying new stuff. I'm not, it's not like I'm different than any of the rest of you guys. I like trying new things and I respect Bob quite a bit. So when I respect somebody, I like to see what they're doing and I like to get some of their genetics if I can. And he said, he had some, and I got on the list. It was, it, he's been sold out for a long time, but um, I'm excited to try him out. Yep, Tim McCann Candleus. Um, it is a great way to grow uh, grow a um, Varroa, and I wish it wasn't so, but it is. Well, and you know, back when I started, I was a hands-off beekeeper because I believe the internet gurus that um, at the time were really dominating the online forums and and they've really pushed out the professional beekeeper the professional beekeeper by and large will say this is how it is and sometimes they're a little rough around the edge some of them are just completely rude crude and socially unacceptable but if you're successful with bees it's not by accident uh, especially if it's on a yearly basis and uh but they just uh they kept getting bludgeoned out of these um these forums and they get tired of it and you know, I, I was one of them back in the day where I was, I was into treatment free stuff and yeah, I thought all that stuff was ridiculous. And here I am now, goodness. But, you know, Laurel serves me crow constantly. So at, at a certain point, when you eat something often enough, you kind of get used to the taste of it. Um, crow with enough barbecue sauce is, is edible. Yeah, Don, um, I, I don't know what I would be doing without her. I definitely wouldn't be do, be here talking to you all tonight without Laurel. I definitely wouldn't be doing this test yard. Probably be driving a semi truck. That's probably what I'd be doing right now. Okay, Laurel rules came and drools. That's taking it a little far, Matthew. Little far. Um, is that what you were laughing in there, Laurel? Crazy dirt. Thanks for the thoughts on the ape of R and Queens. Your sharing of your sharing of knowledge is very valuable for us younger guys making a start in the craft. I don't know how old you are, crazy dirt. Um, but I wish you the best of luck. Um, be beekeepers, uh, according to Bob Benny have to be tenacious. And I, I totally agree. That's probably the only thing that I've done right on a consistent basis since I started beekeeping is I just didn't give up. And I have had, I still have more years of, lack of success than I, I have had with success and um, it's fixing to change for sure over time with more years of success but you all can can figure out what took me a decade and a couple years if you uh look at the right sources and i'm not the only source bob and ian are just such such a value to the industry i really appreciate your donation uh crazy dirt and i hope that this year is really good for you yeah, if you all ever get to meet Laurel, some of you have. She's super shy, but she's really smart and um, very sweet. Um, all the things that I struggle to be. Have you heard of the research on bee gut bacteria that kills Varroa? I have. Um, it's I've heard a lot of those types of things, not necessarily in the bacteria area, but I've heard of fungus and all kinds of different things that are supposed to work. But for whatever reason, they always seem to disappear. And it's probably because they don't work or somebody can't make enough money on it, um, which that stops a lot of products. So, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll figure something out. I'm not sure how I feel about manipulating or modifying bee gut bacteria. Um, I don't know. It just seems like there's been issues with changing things in the past that have caused problems. Uh, maybe it won't. I don't know. I definitely not my area of expertise. We definitely got to keep looking in different areas. I'm confident there are better ways to control varroa, varroa than what we have right now. We've got to work towards it. Um, 
yeah. Um, Russell says, as a team, you guys are a great and, and a great and powerful force, or whatever, a great and a force. Um, yeah, I, we are. That's I think that's why the marriage um, is there because teams are always more powerful. Um, they, they just are, and that's and, and it goes past marriage. Um, the, one of the reasons why I, I'm I'm really feeling a lot of momentum on my end because I am networking more and more. I was telling Greg Burns this the other day. It's such a gift to be able to network with so many beekeepers. Now I'm learning at an exponential rate. It's not just me sharing information. I'm exposed to so much more information and it's helping me make me a better beekeeper and much more well-rounded. So um, it, it's definitely uh, the networking continues. It's, it, Again, a, a colony of bees does not produce honey with just five bees or one bee. It's it's a, it's a team effort. Let's see here. Ooh, picking up 26 queens from Bob. Four of eight for my splits. Great bees. Oh, man, look at you. Well, let me know how those work. I'm sure they'll do great. Let's see here. Well, with that being said... I think I'm going to call it everybody. It's It's been two hours and 20 minutes. I told Laurel I do about two hours. I've been trying to do a little bit better about uh, not being so tardy on these things. And plus, I got to start working on um, some videos and other things like that. A lot of stuff going on here. I really appreciate you all coming on. appreciate the donations and so many other things. Don't forget, you can go through, if you're buying anything like toilet paper Anything from Amazon, even if it's not bee related, you can go through our Amazon links. Help support the experimental yard for free that way. So many free ways to help that out. And um, make sure to check out our sponsors. I've really done my homework investigating these people as individuals, and I feel like they are good people to do business with. And um, otherwise, I would not be fooling with them myself. I'm looking forward to doing reviews on their products and also this test yard. So thank you all so much. I will be having another live chat in the future. I will try to announce it a week or two ahead of time to give pe more people a chance to, to hop on. Hope you all have a blessed spring and um, you're, you're doing well and hope to see you all either on here or somewhere in person soon. Thanks for watching.